go. King Diamond, take one. Growing up when I was a teenager, the big rumor, the thing I heard was, there's this guy in Copenhagen, and he goes by the name of King Diamond, and he has no electricity. <laughs> he lights his entire apartment with candles. I gotta know, is this true? Well, I always had a lot of candles back then. I mean, uh, play, uh, writing music was just by candlelight. I mean, uh, I used to have it in the studio too, only candlelight. You know, of course they needed electricity and uh, very low lights in the control room, but I used to have just two candles so I could just see the lyric. Uh, until one day when uh, it was just me and, and uh, we were doing them, that album, uh, in the studio in Denmark, and uh, we took a coffee break, we were working really hard. And uh, just me and the, the, the producer there, and uh, when we were finished to walk back in, uh, I had all my lyrics on that stand too, and uh, I just saw a pile of black ash on, on this hardwood floor. I was like, oh no, 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 man, they're gonna kill me for this. Some wind had gone air conditioned and the candle in, grabbed a hold of the lyrics. Unfortunately, I had a second set of lyrics, so I would have been in real trouble, but uh, after that, it was like, no more candles, it's, it's crazy. Just a couple of black lights, it's just as well uh, get the, the feeling, because if it's black and you don't see anything around you, I can totally uh, live myself into uh, the characters that I'm singing about in the storyline. Because I remember the rumor being that, you know, because King Diamond's a Satanist, he doesn't believe in electricity, and it's only <laughs> I mean, Seriously, man. I mean, you, you have no idea the rumors I've heard. You know, on, on the road once, uh, there was the crew that told me, oh, you should hear what we told some of the fans. I'm like, you gotta stop that stuff. You're just fueling all this weird stuff, you know? Mm. But they would get over there. I was not even there. I was at the hotel room sleeping. But they said, don't go to that boss, King Diamond sleeping in there. You know, he brings his coffin and soil from Denmark. Uh, if you wake him up, he's guaranteed gonna kill you. I mean, uh, so you gotta be quiet. Like, really soil from Denmark? You know, it's, it's, it, it doesn't help when they tell them these stories, you know, if you believe that, of course, mm. by now, People know uh, from interviews and all this stuff that it's not that kind of thing, you know. And then now and then you can do a little bit yourself when someone asks. I was once in San Antonio on a radio show, I remember a fan was asking a question. Is it true you're sleeping in a coffin every night? And I said, I, you know, seriously, uh, not every night. And then they can think what they want, you know. But I guess that's the power of what you've done, what Alice has done, and what a lot of performers have done, is that people don't know where the line is between the mystery and the reality of the character that you've created. Of course, I mean, that's, of course it's gonna be like that sometimes. I mean, if you, uh, can you imagine my wife's parents, uh, when they saw pictures the first time, like this guy would like to uh, marry your daughter, you know, it's like, huh, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> they don't know what the person is like, you know, but it's, and, and it's all, like I said, it's an extension, it's the same thing. It's just there's some makeup on, you know, I mean, if I didn't have the makeup, I would still do the cremation because uh, I think it looks so cool and it, it, it uh, plays with your mind and it's just uh, really cool. Let me ask you about that. What kind of experience were you looking to give the audience? What do you want people to take away from, from all of this, this show? It, w it was the thing, like I said before, that, you know, you give people these images they can take home and when they listen to that album, they will see that guaranteed and remember it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it's, I think it gives extra value, plus it's, it's great to watch a show if it, if it doesn't take away from the music. And uh, it's a lot of fun to do. There was one time it was not so fun with the cremation, I almost blew up once. Where, where a crew guy did, uh, the guy that was in charge of the, of the whole set, he had to pour these flaming liquids into the coffin uh, five minutes before the actual thing would take place. Mm. And uh, one night uh, there was some problems with our stuff and he gave that uh, job to another guy. And he was so, <laughs> because of <clears throat> having given it, that thing, he was so nervous, he poured it in 50 minutes before the, it, it took place. And when they pushed me into the coffin, I could barely breathe, I was just breathe, breathing in these fumes. Yeah. And uh, had they actually had the chance to take the lid off and come with the torch, it would probably have exploded. Mm. So. I came in there and I kicked for my life, so they couldn't close. They were trying, ah, oh, something is wrong, we've got to close this, you know. And I'm kicking for my life in there, don't close it, God, I don't want to die, you know. <clears throat> and then uh, they, they had to abort it, mm. take it out and just, and I'm jumping out of there, you're trying to kill me, you know, it's like. Something I haven't asked is, were you influenced by horror and did that Horror films oh, man. and brought it into your performance? I always loved it. I mean, I my parents would let me watch, uh, Back when there was only black and white TV, <clears throat> you know, when I was maybe 10, 12 years old, 
I would sit up and watch on black and white TV, uh, Frankenstein and Dracula, all those old classic horror movies. And then I remember wanting the door <laughs> not completely closed, you know, at night. I was sure that they would come out from under my bed and, and do something. And I was relieved in the morning when I woke up and, and uh, Frankenstein had not visited me, you know, and those things. That, so, so it started early, I think, the fascination with it. I uh, used to watch uh, The Addams Family, even though it was like a tongue-in-cheek one, but just the moods, the feelings, seeing the organ that he played in front of those things just fascinated me already from when I was uh, young, you know, and then uh, you had that little scare, but the uh, nice feel of relief when uh, you woke up safe, you know. So you mentioned the feeling, but yeah. so what is the feeling that you get from metal music that's different than feeling you get from other music? I mean, what do you get from metal that that's is power, so satisfying? Man. It gives me a power. There's some kind of a power. I mean, if you don't feel too good one day, you know, uh, play some of that stuff and uh, some of your favorites there, and it'll it'll lift you back up. That that's how it feels to to me. You know, it, it lifts you back up, and it can also make you go over the edge, of course. Where did the really high vocal that everyone associates you with? Where did that come from? How did you develop that style? I was thrown into being a singer actually because uh, uh, the band I play guitar in uh, stopped. And then uh, I was looking for another band to play guitar in, and I saw this ad at a supermarket uh, band looking for a singer. They were playing Deep Purple style. I said, mm, okay, uh, maybe I can sneak in, you know, with my guitar in my back pocket and say I'm a singer slash guitarist. I had never sung in my life. So I got in there, I started singing, okay, what do we do here? Okay, uh, can you sing Space Truck in that? Sure. <laughs> never sung before. So I was just screaming, you know, and after, uh, a few hours rehearsal going home, I had no voice because I couldn't sing. I was just screaming and I tried to hit Gillen's notes by screaming and not being a singer. Eventually, yeah, something happened. I don't know what happened. I think I started learning how to breathe on my own because I never had a lesson. And then there was a fan one night that actually came up to me uh, after a Black Rose show and said, man, you should work on your falsetto. It really sounds cool when you do it. And you can hear on that Black Rose, uh, we released a, a CD uh, quite a few years ago that is from a night of rehearsal with that band. And uh, it's all originals except for Radar Love. And uh, there you can hear the first uh, falsettos coming into a picture there, but uh, very little here and there. And uh, that's then what was, I said, I'll give it a shot. And then I started working on it. And then uh, now it's so in that when I do backing vocals for, you know, uh, you do several sets of backing vocals to create choirs and stuff, they might hold notes and different from the lead and then they start vibrating like this, you know, and uh, when I sing the second one that has to match the first one, you know, uh, I, I get so close, it's a natural feel. I don't have to think about, okay, I did uh, five quick ones and then I went into the slower ones three times. I just do it and the same thing comes out. It's a natural feel. I actually once, it only happened once, cancelled out my two vo uh, vocals, singing a full line. First with one backing vocal, then on the other track, the other one, and playing back, there was nothing mm. because the cancelling, they, they were identical. <laughs> but that's only happened once, it's not like I can do that. But it did happen once. So we had to redo a perfect take just so we could hear. Very last thing, can you give us a small sample of the high falsetto? Ah! <laughs> ah! Cool. I scared the hell out of my cats now, I'm sure. <laughs> Thanks, King. Oh, you're more that than was welcome. Awesome. A pleasure. Absolutely a pleasure, man. Appreciate your time. Oh, more than welcome. Yeah.